All right, so what is pain? We all know what pain is, right? We all know what pain is. But this is, I thought this was funny. It's punishment, right? It's suffering. It's so Canadian. <laughs> pain is suffering. Okay, but what it really is, um, this is a definition of pain um, from the medical, medical literature. It is an unpleasant subjective experience of physical or mental suffering, a symptom of a real or potential underlying cause, condition, or injury. So hopefully today as we go through our session together, you'll understand what all of those tiny little um, components are of that particular definition. And I want you to pay attention to the fact, of course, that is, it is subjective. We've had that experience be before where we meet someone, they stub their toe, and they want to go to the emergency room, right? And then we see other people who, um, you know, they rip their arm off, and they're like, no, it's okay, I'm fine, right? So there is a little bit of, of a subjective component to pain as well, and there's a lot of different factors that play into that subjectivity that we're going to talk a little bit about as well. And then um, what's important to remember as well is that pain is your friend. And that's a really hard thing to accept when you're in a lot of pain, right? If you have sciatica, or if you have um, a problem with your neck, or a problem with your back, or your hip is out of joint, um, is uncomfortable, or you have problem with, problems with your knees, it's hard to accept that pain is your friend. But it really is your friend in the beginning. It's kind of like a love affair, you know, when you meet, just meet some, someone and everything's all wonderful. So initially, pain is there to say, oh, you know what, sweetie, you hurt yourself. Sit down, take a load off, relax, take care of yourself. And then you realize that your relationship isn't really working out, but pain wants to hang around, right? Your, your knee's all better. You're perfectly fine now, but the pain wants to hang around. That's when the, the friendship isn't working out as well anymore. But initially, pain is your friend, and we need to learn how to listen to the pain, to honor the pain, particularly when it comes to um, addressing an injury, particularly when it's a pain that you can't figure out the cause of, because that happens often as well. You have to really pay attention, maybe um, investigate with your, your naturopathic doctor or um, get some tests done to, to figure out what that pain is because it's not attached to anything. You didn't fall down. Why does your neck suddenly hurt, right? Sometimes we need to do that little bit of extra work to figure out what caused the problem. But then over time, sometimes it just doesn't get any better. So we're gonna talk a little bit today about what that means and what you could be doing on a daily basis to continue on that path of pain that you may not, may not know you're actually contributing to the problem. So we're gonna talk about that. So keep in mind that pain is a language. It's the way that your body talks to you. All right, what else? Well, this is getting technical. We're not gonna get too technical today because um, it's really not that much fun. But we have to remember that pain is um, a reaction to a noxious experience. Either it is you've put your hand in the fire, or you stepped your toe, or you fell down the stairs, or you've got a migraine headache because somebody in the next room wore that perfume that always gives you a headache, or whatever the deal is, you've had some exposure with, to a no noxious um, uh, trigger, and now we're having pain. Okay, so typically that involves, when it's, um, when it's a physical pain, it involves the nociceptors, which, is, which are the pain, um, pain points in your body. And then they send a message up to your brain that says, ow, oh, that hurts, all right? So how it actually happens in your body after that signal is sent to your brain that says, okay, I've, I've damaged myself now, I've hurt myself, how does the pain actually evolve from there? So the injury occurs that causes your body to release certain chemicals. And those chemicals 
have different kind of uh, responsibilities in your body. Remembering that the first, the first purpose of pain is to get you to stop doing whatever you did that made you hurt yourself, right? And sit down and relax and rest. So uh, the chemicals are re released into your bloodstream. It causes widening of blood vessels. It, it causes, which then triggers the redness and heat. We've all heard that, right? So you bang your knee on the coffee table. That's the process that happens. Your brain says, ouch, that hurts. Chemicals are released into your body, causes the widening of blood vessels that is associated with redness and heat. It also, those chemicals also increase the permeability of your blood vessels. And we're gonna talk a little bit more about that and the role that that plays as we go on. And those fluids leak into the injured tissue. <coughs> also, when those chemicals are released into your bloodstream, it increases your sensitivity to pain. So in case you're one of those people that um, don't feel pain as intensely perhaps as other people, your body is saying, no, 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 that hurt. You need to stop doing that, that hurt, okay? And um, the last one here, um, the migration of white blood cells, that has to do with the immune system. We're really not gonna get too heavily involved in that today, but understand that when more cells come to the area of injury, it's going to cause inflammation, it's going to cause pressure, and depending on what those cells are applying the pressure to, it could intensify the pain as well. All right, does that all make sense? Very, very simple. So when I talked about the permeability of the blood vessels, this is exactly what's going on in your body. So there's a site of damage, um, and these chemicals are released that, um, induce vasodilation, which is a dilation of the blood vessel, vascular permeability, so things start leaking out, smooth muscle contraction, that's going on as well, and these all lead to pain. So some of those um, vasoactive proteins, particularly bradykinin, we're gonna talk about that today as well, and the role that that plays in your pain. Another form of pain that we're familiar with more when we see it on our bodies. When we have a scar, I was just at the cottage with my family and I thought it would be fun to go out in a canoe. And it was a great idea actually, until I slipped going into the water and the next thing you know, I'm scraping up my arm. Um, so we're familiar with these kinds of scars, right? We can see these. And hopefully this one's going to go away real, rather quickly. But there's also scarring that takes place inside your body and we don't see that as well, right? So if you have a surgery, for example, um, the, the scarring, as your, your tissues are weaving back together, the same proteins, let's say it was your muscles, for example, if you tore a muscle, it's the same proteins weaving back together to create that muscle, but they don't go uh, back together the same way. The proteins kind of line up instead of being all over the place, and that's why you can see the scar. All right, so when you get into a situation like an abdominal tear, or in this picture here, this is uh, the white stuff is in, uh, internal scar tissue from a C-section, okay? So when a body has been pulled apart from surgery, sometimes when it's healing, proteins um, weave together in such a way that create a tough, Fibrous tissue, like, it's, like a scar you would see on your body, only it's inside of you. So uh, that's why sometimes uh, women who've had one C-section are told they have to have another one because those muscles are not going to stretch anymore because of the scar tissue, right? Or um, now when someone has had knee surgery, for example, um, physiotherapy is part of the routine because doctors have started to understand the importance of not allowing the scar tissue to develop. Because when the scar tissue is there, there's decreased mobility, uh, longer time for wound healing, more chance of re-injury, right? So we wanna prevent the scar tissue from um, developing. But we all have scar tissue from stuff, just from life, right? Anyone who, any woman in the room who's had a baby probably has some scar tissue in there, right? because your body expanded so much and then uh, shrunk down again. Anyone who's had any kind of a surgery probably has some scar tissue in there. Anyone who's had a hernia. All of these life experiences we don't really think about, um, 
sort of traumatic body changes, anyone who's been in a car accident, broken a leg, any of those things, there's probably scar tissue present. And because those scar, uh, scar, the internal scar tissue is not as flexible as the other tissue, we get pulling. And inside the body, or in, in the internal organs, for example, they're supposed to slide together, or slide around each other, right? And if they've got something tough, a tough elastic band there, and they, they can't move as easily, that's, that's potentially going to cause some pain, right? So that might, and it could be so subtle. You know, it could be, um, okay, by the way, I, t I talk about myself a lot. I hope you're okay with that. So I'm downstairs before we got together tonight just to get a little snack, and I, and I love soup. Even, yes, even in a hot day, I love soup. But I noticed that the soup was borscht. And I'm thinking, cabbage and beet? Probably not the experience that I want to share with you as I'm standing in the front of, the, of this room, right? A little bit of gas buildup, maybe. My stomach is going to expand. I'll leave the rest of it to your imagination. But even that amount of distension, if I have scar tissue in there, that could hurt, right? But you might, you might not know. You might just say, oh, that's it. I'm never having borscht again without really thinking, hmm, how did that, how did that even happen, right? Oh, yeah, I got my, I didn't, by the way, get my appendix out, but oh, I got my appendix out, or oh, I had a baby, or oh, I had a C-section, or oh, whatever right? Hernia, you name it. All of these things that could cause that internal damage and the internal scarring that you don't know is there. Sometimes I think it would be great if you could just take a zipper and go, <laughs> okay, that's what's going on, right? And that's why I think it's also really important to look in the mirror and see what your skin is telling you and what your hair is telling you and what your nails are telling you because it's really the only kind of guide you have about what's going on inside of you, right? That's a little bit of a segue. So, we probably all have scar tissue, right? So keep that in mind as well. There's also the reality um, that sometimes pain just hurts more. And we know that. Some days we can stub our toe, we're totally cool. Some days we stub our toe in the language that comes out of our mouth, right? Just not appropriate. Uh, so it is impacted by mood, by fatigue, uh, clinical depression, we're starting to see even advertisements on TV are showing this now, you know, that depression actually physically hurts, that there is a connection there, um, and hormones as well. So we'll talk about the ones that we always talk about, and these are the lady hormones. So we're going into a monthly cycle, right? So we've got, at one point of the cycle, we've got estrogen going up, right? This is the, the time of the month where that song goes through my head, I feel pretty, oh so pretty. Because estrogen is the hormone of being beautiful, right? Makes you feel good, feels out all the right places. All the ladies feel good. However, sometimes um, estrogen causes breasts to swell a little bit. That can be painful, right? Um, so yes, estrogen is pretty much the I feel pretty hormone. That goes out. Progesterone. Definitely not the I feel pretty hormone. Um, as, as progesterone goes up, it causes problems like, um, can, can cause headache. This is where we get into breast tenderness, right? Um, progesterone really is the cranky hormone, right? And so this is after, after ovulation has not taken place, right? Progesterone increases, and that's where we get into those PMS achy, painful um, feelings. Prostaglandins, other hormone-like substances in our bodies, increase as uh, the menstrual, menstrual cycle uh, continues, and these increase the perception of pain. We're going to talk a little bit more later how that happens, but this is what's going on. So it feels like it hurts more. All of this causes that increase in pain. So as we go through the cycle of the month, we do re literally feel an increase in pain. And the corollary of that, of course, is the increasing grumpiness, right? And I make a joke, however, it's totally related because there is a pain cycle. And in this particular diagram, um, I'm hoping that underneath that pain in the middle, those lines actually cross because it is all related. So we have 
uh, let's assume that there's been an injury, okay? Um, I don't know, again, you, ha you, you hurt your knee doing biking or something or on a hike. So initially we avoid the activity uh, and then as, as we get better, um, pain, pain decreases, you're able to use it more, for example. Uh, but if, it, if you hurt it again, you're going to avoid the activity, et cetera. So this, this, then you get into worse shape, right? We've all had that experience. This happened to me last year. I hurt my neck. I'm not going to tell you how long it's been since I've been to the gym using the excuse that I hurt my neck, okay? <laughs> so we get into this cycle, right, of, um, of pain. And then it overlaps onto the other side because the longer it hurts, the worse you feel, right? Not only physically the worse you feel, but emotionally the worse you feel. You and the, sleep. pardon me? You can't sleep. And you can't sleep, and that makes it worse. So now you're upset and grumpy, and it hurts more, and you can't sleep, and it just keeps going on and on and on. So it's all related, all right? And that's why it's really, really important to understand when other people tell you they're in pain, try not to judge it because A, you don't, you don't know what they're feeling and B, it's probably impacting so many more areas of their lives than, than they even may be aware of. And once you get on that slippery slope of pain, it can be, it can be a long road back. We've all heard of people who've been in, you know, seriously injured and it takes years for them to recover. Right? Concussions, these are the new, you know, the new injury we're learning more about. People get concussions and it's years before they feel like themselves again. Okay, so we have to be conscious of this relationship between physical pain and emotional pain and how they feed into each other. So who has chronic pain? Well, the numbers are pretty staggering. So 10% of Canadians over the age of 18. Well, this was one study. This was, this was 1,100 people who were surveyed in 2011. So possibly more. Um, and it will increase as the baby boomers get older. Uh, women have more chronic pain than men. It increases uh, the most between the ages of 45 and 65, and then it sort of levels off. Okay? But... Um, a lot of people are suffering with chronic pain. So this is something that um, it affects everybody, whether it's you personally that's experiencing the chronic pain or someone in your family or um, in your community. It's, it's definitely there. Okay. So for those of us who are experiencing chronic pain, I have two um, bulging discs in my neck. And I learned about this because I fell down and hit my head and got a concussion. <laughs> and I went to the doctor and he looked at an x-ray of my head, which included my neck, and then he compared it to an x-ray of my neck that, because I was in a minor car accident, and he said, whoa, you've had some deterioration here. Have you had headaches? And do you, know, do you ever get, you just get used to the way your body is, and you're like, well, yeah, I have a headache every day not really processing the fact that, yeah, I have a headache every single day. So that was explained to me. So, um, but some of my lifestyle choices were making it worse. And it's very possible that you in the room are, are um, let me see, being your own worst enemy is what my mother would say. Okay, so let's see what we can do. So, there are four potential pain promoters. I love alliteration. The first one is posture. It's the first one. This one, actually, the beginning of it reminds me of how I feel when I wake up in the morning. Does anyone else get out of bed in the morning like this? Yes? 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 I haven't figured out what that is yet. It's my feet. Something about my feet. I don't know what I do with my feet. Right? So that, I saw this picture and that's what I thought of myself in the morning getting out of bed. However, the evolution is interesting. So we got upright and then we got technology, which put us right, right back down again. So we really need to be conscious of posture. Even as you're sitting there, 
be conscious of your posture. And a really good trick, by the way, that I learned from a friend of mine who um, is, I, I don't know what her actual title is, exercise physiologist or something. When you're walking around, doing your chores, when you become conscious of the fact that maybe you're slouching or whatever, all you do is turn your thumbs to the back. And when you do that, you lift up your ribs, you lift up your chest. The only other tweak you want to do is tailbone under. So you've got, put your thumbs back, tailbone under, and that's your posture. Um, yeah, yes, your knees should be a little bit out and um, weight over the baby toe. All right, knees, knees out over the baby toe. Okay, but the, the trick that I wanted you to remember, even when you're downstairs with your grocery cart, when you have your grocery cart, don't push it this way because that causes you to lean forward, right? So what you want to do instead is if you hold onto the grocery cart with your palms up, it forces you up. All right, and don't tell anybody I'm going to tell you this, but when you're driving, <laughs> also, if you could palms up, when you're in a safe neighborhood, I wouldn't do it on the 401, right? It's also gonna push you back. So think about those times when you're not in proper posture. Just remember thumbs back and you'll feel yourself lift up, lift up and engage. Okay, so posture is the number one. This is how we do it to ourselves. And these are the common complaints. And that is also probably how I caused the injury in my neck to get worse, that right there is my master's degree that I just finished. I can just about imagine when I'm done the PhD, I will be kissing the computer. So I have to remember constantly, thumbs back. So just be aware of how much pain you're causing yourself by not having proper posture. And one of the other things that I did actually when, when this all came to my attention that I was causing that daily headache uh, was create uh, a stand-up workstation. And you don't have to spend $1,000 to do this. Everybody knows where Ikea is, right? They sell these wicker boxes, like baskets. I have one on top of my kitchen table with a lap desk on top of it with my laptop on top of it. It's the perfect height. I already had the box, so really it cost me nothing. Okay, so you don't have to spend a lot of money. Same thing though, you wanna be able to get, to, to vary it. So stand for a while, sit for a while, whatever, but conscious, conscious all the time that you're not doing this. Okay? All right, potential pain promoter, number two. <laughs> it's the pooping. It's the pooping. Anybody want to guess why? Yes. No, you're solving the problem, Jesus. I'll ask you in one second. Hold that thought. Yes. Exactly. And what would happen then? Yes. Okay, we got two people with the answer here. Well done. They must be regulars, right? No pun intended. Hey, that was good. Okay, so. Uh, really, really important, um, there are 72 different inflammatory conditions associated with improper pooping posture. Wow. Yes, 72. So if you have um, constipation, that's an issue, hernia, um, tenderness, we, we get into kidney stones, we get into anything that's down there, it could be related to improper pooping posture. Okay, so the solution, we've got two women who've already explained what the solution is. This is the pooping solution. When you are sitting on your throne, I wanna get a picture with the, her with the crown, right? Because she's sitting on her throne. So when you're sitting on the throne and you are upright, you have to strain to eliminate. That causes problems, it causes pressure, it causes strain, it causes inflammation, all right? And it can be linked with all kinds of other um, painful experiences that you're not even aware of. Um, that your digestive system 
You have to remember it's attached to everything else that happens in your body. And if that ain't working, ain't nothing working. Okay, so if you're not pooping properly, you probably have bad skin and all kinds of other things. All right, so it's really important that you are in a 35 degree angle-ish when you're on the throne. So get yourself a stool. They sell them at the dollar store, whatever. Just pull it out, do your business. So just put your feet on the stool. You're in the proper position. And what happens when you're sitting, you have this muscle, uh, the uh, puborectalis muscle, that actually constricts elimination. Okay? And when you're sitting in the proper squat position, it's ease. It just, you can be in and out of that bathroom so quick, somebody will think you just changed the towels. I'm serious. And that's what it should be. You should not be going into the, the washroom with a book for a thousand different reasons, <laughs> but you shouldn't be in there for, you know, more than just a few minutes. The important position, it's important to get into that 35, 22 to 35 degree angle with your body to allow that muscle to, to be, um, uh, to, to not be constricting is what I'm saying. Okay, so it should be easy breezy lemon squeezy in the bathroom. All right? Okay, so potential pain promoter number three. How many people sleep on their stomach? Yeah. There's a lot of research now showing it's a major cause of back pain. You know what the other one is? Pillow top mattresses. Bad, bad, bad. Uh, because they're too soft. Right? Your, ba your body actually needs support when you're sleeping. Um, and this is the best position for sleeping. On a firm mattress, not a pillow top mattress. Now, I'm not saying like a rock hard mattress. You want to be comfortable, but not, not a pillow top. Yes. Um, I've actually never seen that one. Has anyone seen that that pillow in the back? Yeah. You've seen the this one. I've seen I've seen the half pillow and I've seen this one. I, I have never seen this one like in a um, you know at a store or what have you. Massage office. Yeah, massage office. Probably something like that. Um, the one behind the knees is amazing. If you just do that. Tonight when you go home, here's your homework. Take a pillow and put it under your knees and lie on your back. And you can email me if you don't feel better. Like, I'm serious. Okay, now I have to brag a little bit. My daughter is in naturopathic college. She's been practicing on me. And she put me in this position. This is my daughter over here in the front. She put me in this position for a treatment and I almost fell asleep right there. It was so comfortable. Mm. Right? I'm a back sleeper anyway, but just to have that pillow under my knees, mm. unbelievable. I saw a hand up. Yes? Uh, it's best to sleep on your back. Side um, is helpful for women who are pregnant to sleep on the right side, I think it is, to improve blood flow to the heart. Um, but generally, we should try to sleep on our back. If that is not how you fall asleep, it's, re it's a really hard thing to change. Um, but this is, try at least to fall asleep this way. OK, bonus tip, because we talked earlier about you can't sleep when you're in pain. OK, research has shown that if you can't sleep because you're in pain, if you have a nap, it's very restorative and reduces your pain. Okay, so do you, do you nap? You do now, right? Okay. A live magazine, I think it was last month, had an article on napping. If you don't have it, um, you should read that article. It was quite helpful. Okay. Potential pain promoter number four. I have no idea what he's eating, but that's fine. So it's a, this is a palate problem. So soy foods, corn oil, uh, safflower oil, High in omega-6 fats, these particular refined oils, we get way, way, way too much of them in the diet. Um, 
and they are high in inflammatory fats. So we're going to talk a little bit more about that in a second. Um, what happens is, so you eat your omega-6 fats, because we all know we're supposed to have them, right? Um, Omega-6 fats contain GLA, which is the good omega-6 fats. It's an anti-inflammatory fat. I highly recommend taking GLA on its own and skip the omega-6 salt. Like, don't even do that. Because the conversion is really challenging for your body to do. So if you want to get GLA, have GLA on its own. You can buy it uh, in supplement form. GLA is an anti-inflammatory fat. We can see that it... Um, changes into pro prostaglandin E, that's the anti-inflammatory, okay? We go along the line though, omega-6, other than the GLA, converts into arachidonic acid. Arachidonic acid is not a good thing. If you want a trick to remember what it is, arachidonic reminds me of the word arachnid, which is spiders, which are not something that most people want to have around. So, arachidonic acid, not good. It uh, promotes prostaglandin E2, which is an inflammatory um, fat. In fact, this uh, conversion here is what a lot of pain medications block. Right here, um, this is what the NSAIDs block, is that conversion between arachidonic acid and prostaglandin E2. So the NSAIDs, COX-2 inhibitors, that kind of thing, um, which are linked with uh, ulcers and, and upset tummies. So just be aware that omega-6 diets in excess in your diet also increases your perception of pain. So not only does it increase inflammation, but it also increases how much you feel like it hurts. All right, so we, what we want to do is actually turn that down. So the solution is choosing a different fat. We want to focus on the omega-3 fats, okay? Because they're anti-inflammatory. The other problem is too much sugar. We, everybody in the room know that sugar is an inflammatory. We won't call it food, we'll call it a white powder. Okay, so um, too much sugar in the diet causes inflammation, increases um, blood glucose, which causes inflammation, um, and that is linked to um, free radical production, which causes inflammation, huh. and um, excess sugar in the diet, excess carbohydrates in the diet convert to fat, which causes inflammation, which then causes more fat accumulation, which then causes more inflammation, and so on, and so on, and so on. So we want to get the sugar out of the diet, okay? So if you are in chronic pain, you want to sit up straight, you want to poop properly, you want to um, sleep on your back, and you want to correct your dietary imbalances. So get the sugar out and increase your omega-3 fats, okay? From fish and fish oil are the best way to go. All right, and we know that. Uh, and when you get more fruits and vegetables in your diets, not only are you getting more of those free radicals that are so healthy, but you get a lot of the vitamins and minerals that we need in order to reduce inflammation as well. Okay, so your diet is really key if you have chronic pain. Even if you don't have chronic pain, even if you have surgery or you, have, you bang your knee or whatever, right? You wanna reduce the inflammation as much as you can. And by the way, omega-3 fats, uh, EPA and DHA are the, contain what's called resolvins. And they're the only sources of resolvins which have been identified as um, chemicals that resolve inflammation. Hmm. Omega-3 fats are the only identified source of resolvins. So the first one is seropeptase. Now what I enjoy about this personally is that it comes, um, or it is an enzyme. So in nutrition, we are aware of uh, digestive enzymes that help us break down food, right? So enzymes are protein catalysts for every single chemical reaction that takes place in your body. Sometimes they help with breaking down food, but they have lots of other jobs to do as well. So uh, serapeptase is an enzyme that digests 
non-living tissue, all right? Um, it is excreted by the silkworm as it tries to break out of its cocoon. So you think of a cocoon, very fibrous, right? Very similar to scar tissue, all right? Same kind of um, proteins there. And this is what happens. The, the silkworm uses this enzyme to get out, all right? That's what serapeptase is. It's been used extensively for over 40 years, and it is scientifically proven. If you look up serapeptase on some of the medical research sites, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of studies. Okay, this one has, has really um, been studied. So how does it work? It inhibits your body's, uh, the body's reaction that creates bradykinin. Okay, that chemical that causes the, um, the, the cells to dilate and to cause them the fluid release. Uh, it helps um, inhibit bradykinin so that you can get back to the normal pain threshold, right, rather than being hyper, right? Do you know that somebody poking you, you're fine, you're fine, you're fine, you're fine, and suddenly then it just really hurts? And it's not hitting you very hard, but okay. It's because um, you become more sensitized to the pain. So what you want to do is actually just turn down that sensitizing reaction, right? And uh, serapeptase helps with that. It reduces inflammation which is a factor in pretty much everything. Uh, inflammation is present in anything that ends with I-T-I-S, right? So um, dermatitis, appendicitis, arthritis, name your itis, that's inflammation. Okay, but there's so many other things that involve inflammation that, that like obesity, as we just talked about, okay? Um, so it's really, really important to reduce inflammation. And it also uh, calms down the nociceptors, which are those pain, pain points. Just makes them relax as well, okay? Uh, the primary ind indication for serapeptase is pain, all right? Even, even though it's an enzyme, um, it's not one that you use to help to digest food. And as a result of that, it's really important if you're taking serapeptase to take it away from food because you don't want your body using it to digest food. It's, you can use other enzymes for that. Eat your food raw. Lots of raw fruits and vegetables contain their own enzymes, for example, or if you're going to have a digestive enzyme, have it with your meal. Serapeptase is one of those ones that you want to have away from your food. Okay, we get that question a lot in nutrition. So serapeptase, take that one away from your food. Uh, and it has been studied in reference to these things and many more. Okay? Yes? What's the minimum time period between taking serapeptase? Okay, so you would take it 30 minutes before you eat? 30 minutes. 30 minutes before you eat or two hours after? Could be longer. Sure. I, I think it's great if you're going to be taking something like this, even have the bottle on your bedside table. So when you wake up in the morning, take it with a glass of water and then, you know, get up and do your morning business and um, then by the time you're ready to eat, it's already been half an hour and you've, you know, likely not eaten for at least eight hours, right? So that's a good time to take it, but two hours after um, if you're eating as well, okay? And it's safe to take with uh, other products as well, though, of course, Standard disclaimer, if you're on medication, you want to make sure that, yes? Okay, so uh, it's kind of, it just basically means bacteria. So when, when you have um, a cut, for example, you know, we're supposed to wash it. Anything that's left over can cause an infection. That's essentially what we're talking about. So serapeptase can help kill the bacteria that cause infection in an injury. So serapeptase is sort of the foundation if you have chronic pain. You want to make sure that you can get rid of scar tissue. You want to make sure that you can reduce the inflammation in your body. Again, sometimes that's not enough, right? Sometimes you need a little bit more. So um, there are a few other nutrients that you can use as well. Um, hops extract is really uh, useful for 
um, providing pain relief, which is important, and, um, and to reduce inflammation. Again, the goal is always, always, always to reduce inflammation. Turmeric, I'm sure everybody is familiar with um, the studies that are coming out on the importance of turmeric in your diet. Very good for uh, inflammation. Um, COX-2, we talked about that before. Pardon me? Curcumin. Turmeric, yep. Pardon me? Sure, those are great dietary um, additions as well, for sure. Um, but turmeric specifically, is important for down-regulating COX-2, which is the um, inflammatory um, piece, and also TNF, which destroys tissue. Okay, so that's really important if you're having joint problems. Okay, you want to protect your tissue. Yes. Now, does fresh turmeric do the same thing as powdered turmeric? It's really important to have turmeric in your diet, absolutely, but you you don't know. Um, you know how fresh it is and all of that kind of thing so yeah, that's a big carrot. okay also some when it's when it's uh, in a formula then it's standardized so you so the manufacturer can speak to to the levels in it when you get it and you add it to your food which everybody should do 100 percent but you don't know um, where it was grown even if it's organic and whatever there's a whole bunch of different things that impact the nutrients and the power of the, the ingredient, right? Yes? Is this the right input as far as the wood? Is this the right input as far as the wood? Is this the right input I'm sorry, I didn't hear the beginning. Is this the right input as far as the wood? Is that the capsule? In the capsule. Oh, when you add it to your food, again, um, when yeah pepper helps you absorb it um so we're talking about black pepper helps you to absorb nutrients again it depends on your digestion and we don't know if it's not a standardized extract what's in it we can all agree that turmeric is wonderful and we should all have it in our diets but that's that's where we are with using it therapeutically versus using it in a culinary way Okay, so therapeutic is always more specific and it's always, um, it, sorry, it's usually more intense, right? There's usually more. Yes? I take a pill for it. I take a pill and I buy the uh, Yeah. yeah. Sure. Every smoothie I make, I put it in. Wonderful. This is fabulous. And we should. We should. I'm a nutritionist. I'm sorry, I just banged the mics, both of them. Um, really important to get our nutrients from our food really really important okay but we're talking about ther therapeutic dosing now yep uh, the principle that you are your own guinea pig and you'll experiment with turmeric and uh, when you feel there's the results you'll go oh yes if you don't feel there's results then maybe you need more or maybe uh, or maybe that one's not going to work for you yeah right exactly thank you that's a good point yes what about they're awesome I love them. I love them. What was that, cayenne pepper and ginger? Cayenne pepper increases heat in your body. Uh, it also has capsaicin in it, which is important for pain relief as well. Um, ginger, great for your digestion. Antioxidant, uh, great for your immune system, etc. Okay, back to um, trying to in uh, increase pain relief. Uh, Devil's Claw is another nutrient, uh, an herb that helps to block the inflammatory pathways. This is one of those ones you're not going to get immediate results. It's you can take it for a while, and then you're going to have, um, hopefully you'll experience uh, relief with this one, and this one's really good for, black, for back pain. And Boswellia is another um, good nutrient for uh, helping to protect joint damage or, or prevent joint damage okay um, and it improves joint pain and mobility and pine bark extract is antioxidant anti-inflammatory bromelain is another enzyme again that helps to to um, be the spark plug to get things going inside of your body but it also helps to break down um, both foods 
and uh, things that you don't want to have in your body as well. Okay, can you all see that? The knees are the first thing to go? No. It says the knees are the first thing to go and his kneecaps are at his ankles. Okay, all right. So um, in terms of joint support, if you feel like you need um, a little bit of help with your joints, uh, different nutrients that we know are uh, helpful, uh, glucosamine, um, MSM, really good for reducing pain and inflammation as well, bamboo silica. Uh, silica is an important nutrient in our diet and it's another one of those ones that as we get older, we don't absorb them as well. So we want to make sure that uh, we're getting enough silicon in the diet. One way you will know that you're not is if you don't like the quality of your hair or your fingernails or you're having problems with your skin because it's sort of considered the beauty nutrient, right? This is one of the easy ones to tell maybe if you're not getting enough and it's really good for your joints as well. Uh, vitamin C doesn't get a lot of attention, but it's really, really important for collagen. Okay, C equals collagen. Make sure you're getting lots of vitamin C in your diet. I'm sorry? Which is the highest amount? Which is the best? Amount? I don't know. I don't know. Camel, camel? Sure. I don't know. I don't camel? know about vitamin Cs. I don't. Camel, camel? Eat lots of vitamin C. Eat lots of vitamin C. And then make sure that you're supplementing with it as well. Okay, that's another one. If you're not liking the way that your skin is looking, you probably want to up your vitamin C because it helps with the coll collagen, which is a foundation upon which your skin is built. And because your skin is the only thing you can see, then you can assume if you don't like the look of your skin, you probably are not going to like the look of your joints. Right? Vitamin Absolutely. Yeah, really important antioxidant as well. Uh, we have sort of covered this. Uh, collagen, um, as a nutrient, type 2 collagen prevents joint, joint deterioration by helping your body make hot, more hyaluronic acid. So to explain what that is, we have two parts of a joint, right? We have like the stick and then we have the ball. And in order for the, the joint to move, we need a cushion, right? We need a fluid cushion and that fluid cushion is hyaluronic acid. And people with have, who have joint pain often don't have enough hyaluronic acid and then we've got bone on bone. All right? Not, you can just imagine what that sounds like, let alone what that feels like. All right, so it's really important to increase the hyaluronic acid and uh, type two collagen helps with that. Helps increase uh, chondroitin sulfite and um, reduces autoimmunity to collagen as well because um, that can be a problem. So that's for people who have um, arthritis in which their body is attacking their joints, right? That's not, um, that's not a good thing to have either. Again, we've, we've covered silicon, really important for bones and skin and it declines as we age. Okay, um, and the last pain uh, pain factor that I wanted to talk about today um, applies to the ladies and all the men who know them. Um, because sometimes, you know, just as a review, um, remember that arachidonic acid, spiders, not so good, um, and it turns into those inflammatory um, chemicals, the prostaglandins that make pain hurt more, um, and you can see if you follow down that line, we get into um, muscle, muscle contractions, cramps and pain, et cetera, and we have too much arachidonic acid in the diet as well. In your uterus, antispasmodic as, as, as well helps to calm things down. So black haw is going to help with cramps, um, those really intense bearing down pains, um, back pain, uh, and heavy bleeding as well. Again, uh, just to go over, um, Perluxin, COX-2 inhibitor, 
really important again to keep the inflammation down and it's an analgesic that's going to help as well. Chase Fairy is really, really important for women of all ages. It's like my favorite. Um, it's great for PMS, it's great for um, perimenopause and um, menopause as well. So um, keep that one in mind, helps to regulate moods. It helps uh, with water retention, breast pain, cramps, etc. Turmeric, we've already talked about that, but again, remember its importance uh, as an anti-inflammatory, as an antioxidant. B, enough B1 in the diet is really uh, helpful to uh, reduce pain as well, and vitamin B6, getting enough of that in the diet helps uh, to reduce the intensity of cramps. And remember as well that all those B vitamins are burned up when you're stressed. Ladies, raise your hand if you're not stressed. Duncan, yes sir, very well done. <laughs> okay, so my point there was we're all pretty stressed, so make sure you're getting enough of the B vitamins in your diet as well. All right, you guys have been great with the questions, but any more? Magnesium. magnesium is great for muscle cramps. Um, if you have lots of magnesium in the diet or an Epsom salt soak, is great for muscle cramps. Yes, just one sec. Yep. I've been trying to take notes because my husband is, has extreme pain. Okay. Uh, fibromyalgia. Um, but is it possible to get a copy of your presentation? Absolutely. Yeah, that'd be awesome. Yep. Yeah, if you, um, I, I will make sure that, that you have that. Okay? Yes. Yes. Is the collagen, um, is it vegetarian? Um, no, it's not. I think it's fish. And so it depends. It's not vegan, I guess, but it's vegetarian if you have your fish. Yes. Is keratin made an animal product? It is made by the silkworm, so that depends on your definition of that as well. Yes. So the silkworm doesn't have to die? No. <laughs> yes. Yes. Where does the bodily excretion come from? What's the process? Well, now that's a technical question. I don't know, but I'm going to guess they spit it up. But, um, Virginia, yes. how? How was the question? Oh, the um, silkworm. How do they produce the? Uh, how do they produce the serapeptase? How does the silkworm produce it? Do they like spit it up? See, that's a really good question, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Okay, but if they if they use it to get out of the cocoon, then I would imagine that it's outside of their bodies, right? Yeah. yeah. But we can find out for sure. Do they do they die? Do they kill them? Virginia, I don't know the answer to this one. The 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 worms are fine, right? Yes, they're fine. <laughs> okay. Yes. Are there any side effects of taking the uh, Only feeling awesome. I haven't heard yet of anyone. Now, if you if you want to have some fun, there's this guy on YouTube who took a like a gazillion capsules of serapeptase and then didn't feel well. And like I'm talking, he was taking I can't even tell you how many units, like a like a, probably a jar a day, right? Because he's of the, the the philosophy, which is very North American. If a little bit is good, then a lot must be awesome, right? So he took what he should have taken and started to feel better, so he just damped it up. And then I think his eyes were bleeding or something. Like it was, re I'm kidding, but he had to go, he went to his naturopath because his eyeballs were red, right? Because what was happening was um, he was detoxifying rapidly and he, he overtaxed his liver. But it's because seriously, it was a ridiculous amount that he was taking. So. You should, like even if the next time you get a cold, respiratory infection, if you take it, you'll notice easier breathing. So I have another question. If I'm taking that, should I avoid anything? Yeah. If it's not great, or 
stay away from food, take it away from food, but there are no contraindications. Yes, 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 ma'am. Okay, the rule with magnesium is similar to the rule with, with vitamin C. If you're using it therapeutically, you take it up to the point at which you have loose bowels, then you dial it back. Okay? Now, the thing about magnesium, if you have muscle pain and you have an Epsom salt bath, that is like the best thing you can do. Um, but don't be cheap with the Epsom salt. Like, you need four cups of Epsom salt in your bath. 15 minute lukewarm soap, get out, you will sleep like a baby. Right. Yeah, three quarters of a cup, I would say something like that. Yeah, most people don't use enough Epsom salt for a soak, right? I mean, if it's just a regular thing you put in the water because it feels good, great. But if you're in, if you've got pain, you want to make sure you're getting enough. Yes. I, I'm going to find that out. You just just wait later because that was the second question about the uh, animals. Okay. Yes. About which? The actual supplement? Well, we can answer your questions, absolutely, but for sure, Anorex has a website. You can go to the website. Uh, and I do, you know, that's a good question. You should always do your own due diligence, right? And you should always do your own uh, research, but don't, don't go to the internet. Dr. Google, I don't know where he got his degree, right? Make sure you go to the actual journals. Go to the medical journals. And when you're there, check to see who paid for the study, because that's important to know too. Right? Look for the conflict of interest on the study, and then you can make your own decision whether or not you're going to trust that information. And if you're getting pain from due to cancer, yes. that's what I'm getting right now. Okay. Okay. And it's still coming out six months later. Um, how do you be sure if you take something like this to get the pain to subside that you're doing the right thing? Okay, when it comes to any kind of specific condition like that where you're on medication or you you should be talking to your, your healthcare practitioner, that's not something that I can no, really But a naturopathic doctor or something like that? Um, no, I'm doing it on my own. I'm eating so much better. I'm eating so much better. Okay. Um, all kinds of different things. Okay. I'm not, I'm not comfortable specifically talking about that in front of a group, so we can talk a little bit about that later if you wish. Um, any other questions? Yeah. Can I take him oil? I, I am not familiar with magnesium oil. Sorry. It would, it would help whenever there's inflammation, right? And so, so yes. So the answer is yes. Because if there's an infection, there's an itis, and there's inflammation there. So it's going to be helpful for sure. Yes. Sir. Is it a recent surgery? Uh, yeah. For, yeah. yeah. Um, as long as it's healed, you should you should shouldn't have any sort of contraindications for it. Do you know what I'm saying? Like it should as long as it's not you're off medication and that kind of thing, you should be fine. It just you well you always want to be careful if your doctor's gone your medication. You don't want to be. Um, you know, experimenting as we were talking about being a guinea pig, right? But. Yeah, it depends on the. But but if you're off medication, then there shouldn't be a problem, right? And again, as I said before, this is used as an adjuvant, meaning that it it works with other things. But I am not your doctor, and I'm right. Okay, yes. Does it help to dissolve like uh, like gout? Or it is definitely worth a try. I don't know what the research is on gout. I would have to, to, to look that up. But um, again, anytime there's inflammation, there's definitely inflammation with gout. It's going to help, for sure. Yes? Can you just put it to us, right? 
Pardon me? Can you defer Absolutely. 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 Yes. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, if you can see a scar, then you have that is scar tissue, right? Now, serapeptase is not going to get rid of your life history. <laughs> on the, you know, when you've got when you've got a scar on your skin, um, it could it could maybe help with the inflammation with a new injury and that kind of thing. But it's not going to get rid of chickenpox scars and that kind of thing. It's more what's going on inside your body. Okay. Yes. <coughs> yeah, okay, oh, sure. So I was, I was going to ask for someone who has arthritis and is on blood thinners, it would be best to ask the doctor about this, right? About serapeptase. And, and it should be, it should be fine. Know. It should be fine. Okay. But again, if My we're... My dad just had a triple bypass, so any of that, right? So I'm just wondering that. So it's best to ask the cardiologist and get this. Yes, but, but it's, it's, probably, it's probably fine because I don't see the... The connection between them. Like a starting dose, no. I'm sorry. Like a starting. Dose. Starting. Is there a starting, or is starting it just no? It's. It depends on. It's you your know. own. You know, where do you rate yourself? How effective are you? You know, how much do you think you need? How much scar tissue do you think you have? How much inflammation do you think you have? Um, that's all a factor in it. All right. Yes. Have you been there uh, or two help? Shows that we have. Carl has two health shows, one coming up in about a month in October. Yes. And one in the spring. Has this company been there? Uh, yeah, m more on the, um, the trade side, but the upcoming shows, they will be there. I'm not sure which ones you're talking about, but it's the Whole Life, Life Expo, we will be there. Total Health, um, total health, health I don't remember. Here's total Health. April. Uh, I don't. We. I don't know about that one. But the one that's coming up, yes, for sure. Okay. Is the other two next month or no? I don't think that one. Yes. Uh, can you talk a little bit more about the GLA-R oil? Like we use it in because often when I buy it, there's two, three, six, nine. How do you get the six and not the nine? You know? Okay. <laughs> My personal opinion is we get enough six. We don't need to supplement six. We need to up, 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 up the three. And the nine takes care of itself. Like, I, I supplement with three a lot. And that's the only one I worry about. So when you're buying, you just look for I do. I just have straight up fish oil. And what fish products have to be Deep water fatty fish is the best. If you're vegan, it gets a little bit more challenging um, because your body has so to. Be okay. Um, then you could do, um, there's some different like sea plants that Borage. you can get that are sources. Borage has a little bit in it as well. Um, uh, flaxseed, yes, but when you, well, we're getting a little off topic here, but there's a conversion that happens when you're trying to get omega-3 fats from mm -hmm. omega-6 fats, or sorry, from, from um, plant foods. Approximately one to nine percent of the um, ALA that is available in those foods converts to a usable form. So that's only a little bit. And that is in the perfect run body. That is in like you are doing everything right and everything's working just great. But age is a factor, stress is a factor. Um, if um, lifestyle habits like smoking and drinking, like things impair that conversion a lot. So it is a challenge for vegans to get enough omega-3 fats. It has to be a, com a concerted effort to get those nutrients into your body. Um, so look for like sea plants and that kind of thing. It's going to be the closest. Okay, one more question and then I have to stop only because I'm losing my voice. Can yes. You get omega from and yes, you can get some. Yeah. Again, remember the conversion is very small. One more. Yes. What um, Pain X. Pain X, yeah. All right, there's information. Now remember.